This video is on the most important insights of the CAPM. The CAPM, short for Capital Asset Pricing Model, is the most cited equilibrium model that tries to explain why some assets pay negative returns on average while others pay positive ones. Simplistically speaking, the CAPM has three main messages. First, an asset's expected risk premium is proportional to the expected market risk premium. We can write that as follows. Second, the proportionality coefficient is called beta, and it stands for the covariance of asset A's return with the market divided by the variance of the market return. So the beta of an asset quantifies the amount of systematic risk that asset A contributes to the well-diversified market portfolio. And the third takeaway is that a cap M also reveals that high average returns are not earned by holding high variance stocks, but instead only if that stock carries a lot of systematic risk. So according to the cap M, the expected risk premium of a stock is unrelated to the stock's idiosyncratic risk. Now, for the remainder of this video, let's understand where these cap M insights come from. The cap M theory was awarded the Economics Nobel Prize in, 19, in 1990, and it builds directly on the mean variance portfolio choice problem of Markowitz. The CAPM insights hold if the following assumptions hold. First assumption, all investors are Markowitz type mean variance portfolio optimizers. With that, I mean all investors are price takers meaning their wealth is so small relative to the total amount of wealth in an economy that their trading doesn't affect asset prices. Now it also means that all investors have the same single holding period. Now having a single holding period implies that these investors are myopic. Another implication is that investors can only invest into publicly traded assets. And lastly, none of the investors pays taxes or any type of transaction costs. Now the second assumption for the cap M is that all investors share the same homogeneous expectations about the risk-free rate the expected holding period return of all assets, mu, and the covariance matrix of returns, capital sigma. Now these two assumptions imply the following logical consequences. Consequence one, all investors will come up with the same tangency portfolio and they will all hold a complete portfolio that is a levered up or down version of the tangency portfolio. Consequence two, the equilibrium market clearing condition requires that all positive net supply assets are held by investors in the aggregate. That implies that the tangency portfolio must coincide with the aggregate market and hence can be called market portfolio. Consequence number three, the proportion that each positive net supply asset has in the market portfolio coincides with the price of that asset multiplied by the number of shares outstanding and divided by the total market value of all positive net supply assets. The price of each asset adjusts freely such that the aggregate demand for that asset equals its fixed supply. 
Konsequenz vor. As the market portfolio is a Markowitz efficient portfolio that invests 100% of wealth into the tangency portfolio, it holds that the expected risk premium for the aggregate market is proportional to the anticipated amount of market variance. The propor propor uh, proportionality coefficient coincides with the relative risk aversion of the representative investor. So mathematically, it means that the expected risk premium of the market equals risk aversion of the market times the variance of the market return. So note here the notation gamma m is the market's aggregate risk aversion and variance of rm is the expected variance of the holding period market return. On the left hand side is the expected market risk premium for the single holding period. Note, because M, the market, is an efficiently diversified portfolio, all its variance risk, VAR of RM, is systematic and hence non-diversifiable. Now consequence five. The expected risk premium of an individual security is proportional to the expected market risk premium. So we write that as follows. Where the proportionality coefficient beta a is defined as the covariance of return a with the market return divided by the variance of the market return. And that beta a is the measure for the amount of systematic risk that asset A contributes to the market's total risk. When you combine the last three equations, you obtain a statement about the expected risk premium of an investment A that you don't see too often written that way. Namely, it says that in the cap M it holds that the expected risk premium of asset A is the risk aversion of the market times the covariance of asset A's return with the market return. I want to explicitly talk about this exp expression because I can see that at first it might create confusion. But as we resolve that confusion, your understanding of that important concept is going to improve. That's why let's look at that expression more carefully. First, it says that an asset's expected risk premium is only zero if either the market's aversion for variance risk is zero or if all of an asset's return variance is diversifiable. Second, you also read from that equation that an investor's degree of risk aversion doesn't matter at all for the priced in risk premium of an asset. It's only the aggregate risk aversion in the market that matters. So an investor who is less risk averse than the aggregate market will find the expected risk premium that's priced into the market very appealing. On the other hand, an investor with a risk aversion that equals gamma m will find the priced in risk premium to be just all right. While individual investors whose risk aversion is higher than gamma m would perceive current asset prices as being too high. Yet they would still invest in a portfolio that lines up on the capital allocation line. But they would use an investment that is less risky than the market portfolio. So they would lever down relative to the market. Now third, Notice that so-called hedge assets are priced in the market 
to earn on average a negative expected risk premium. That is intuitive because a hedge asset reduces portfolio risk and therefore increases the Sharpe ratio of the portfolio, which increases the slope of the capital allocation line. All mean variance investors want to hold such a hedge asset. Now these hedge assets are in fixed supply. The only way to meet the excess demand in equilibrium is to have these assets trade at a higher price. So as the price of the asset increases, the excess demand shrinks towards zero. And the market for that asset will be back in equilibrium, where demand equals supply. But now ask yourself, why has the price of the hatch asset gone up? Well, the risk-free rate is fixed and the expected cash flows are fixed as well. So it's the cash flows expected risk premium that is falling, which leads to a reduction in the discount rate and hence an increase in the net present value of these future cash flows. So the price goes up. In my experience, it's that economic insight that some students struggle with most at first. It's hence advisable to stop the video and to rehear that argument if you feel that you need to hear it a second time. Now the fourth and last learning point that I want to highlight is that the larger the co-movement of an asset's return with the aggregate market, the higher the asset's risk contribution to the aggregate market portfolio and hence the higher its risk premium. Make sure you see the implication on asset prices. Namely, if the risk premium increases, the discount rate for future cash flows increases, which makes the asset trade at a lower price. That is why I called the expected risk premium a while ago the priced-in risk premium. Because it's the risk premium that according to the cap M is used to discount future cash flows of any project. And that priced in risk premium depends according to the cap M on two factors, risk aversion of the market times the covariance of the assets return A with the market return. So it doesn't depend on an individual's risk aversion but on the market's aggregate risk aversion. And it also doesn't depend on the variance risk of a project, but on its covariance with the well-diversified market portfolio.